Hey guys, uh, it's me, Siren. Back with another video. Excuse the light. Clearly my light is coming from over there. Uh, bear with me. Um, today's video is going to be about uh, black identity and black authenticity. And I feel like I felt like this was something that I needed to make a video about because it is something that I'm seeing a lot. Uh, these conversations about authenticity in the black community and identity. Um, it was really kind of inspired by a wonderful essay that I read um, that was called Inside Passing Strange. Passing Strange is a brilliant Broadway play that one of my good friends recommended to me. Um, I'm going to try and find a link. The original link that I watched it on on YouTube that was on my friend's page has since been taken down, but I'm going to see if I can find another one. Um, I'll definitely link you to my friend's page so you guys can check it out. And Passing Strange is an all-black rock musical about um, a main character called Youth, who's a black male. He's a black youth, and he's kind of, he has a musical epiphany, and he's kind of traveling through Europe trying to find himself um, and trying to find himself as an artist, as a man, as a black man, as a musician, just he, he's on a path of, of self-discovery, you know, a hero's quest, so to speak, um, in keeping with the popular trope, a hero's quest. Um, what makes Passing Strange really interesting is that we see a black youth you know, in his hometown of L.A., and then traveling through Europe and kind of evolving. And questions of identity and authenticity, and especially in the black community, are major themes of the play. The youth struggles with not feeling black enough. Um, you know, he has a love of rock music, punk, punk alternative, that his mother doesn't understand, you know, she, she tries to drag him to church, she doesn't want to go, she doesn't understand. Um, later on when he's in Europe, he's in Amsterdam and he's in Munich and Germany and they kind of look at him through a gaze where they see his blackness, you know, he arrives in Europe and the first thing they ask him is, do you play jazz, you know, do you play rhythm and blues because these are stereotypical black genres but he wants to play kind of alternative heavy metal rock music and stuff like that and I kind of feel like these are important issues because these are things that a lot of us face um and if you're black well all of us all people white black hispanic asian you know we all have that period of time be it you know adolescence to your teenage years, teenage years to young adulthood, young adulthood to middle age, and even middle age up until elderly and until death, you know, we're kind of constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly reimagining ourselves. We're constantly on a search for identity. But something that is unique to black people and especially black people in this country is that we have um, almost like a dual, a dual journey. We're not just on a journey to find ourselves. We have that journey the same as white people, but we also have to combat stereotypes about what is blackness, about black authenticity, about the black experience. Um, you know, in Passing Strange, when he's in Germany, um, the youth, the narrator, he kind of falls into this, identity of like a ghetto angry you know black car caricature and we've seen from watching the play that he's not none of those things you know he grew up in a you know middle class upper middle class affluent neighborhood of black professionals in LA he lives in like a nice house with his mom you know they go to church they have nice cars they have nice clothes but when these Germans see him like I said, they immediately kind of see an angry black ghetto youth, you know, and that's what's authentic to them. He he does a number about it called the black one because, you know, he's the black one. Um, and that's something that a lot of us have to struggle with, you know, what is be what is it to be black? What does it mean to be black? You know, what 
are the benchmarks of blackness, you know, black authenticity. You often get told, oh, you speak, you know, so well for a black person. Oh, you're so articulate. What does that mean? You know, do you think that black people don't know how to speak well? That no black people know how to articulate themselves? Um, and then you even get from the black community sometimes, oh, you talk white, you dress white, you like white people music, you like white people movies. So there's like a duality of, of you know, a struggle to kind of figure out who you are and what is your identity, what is your place in the black community, what is your place not in the black community, and constantly having to try and prove, you know, prove to yourself and prove to others who you are. And something that I feel like matters but is hardly talked about is that black people also have ideas and concepts about identity that we receive from the white gaze because the white gaze is constantly on us and the white gaze has so many stereotypes and caricatures you know I read a really brilliant New York Times article where a guy is talking about how, you know, he's walking down the street with a telescope because he loves science and he's stopped by a cop and the cop says, I almost blew you away. I thought you were holding a weapon. You know, this kind of ties into my other video. The criminalization of black bodies to the point where we're doing completely innocent things, holding completely innocuous objects, and through the white gaze, they become weapons, guns, drugs, knives, swords, you know... Trayvon Martin was holding soda and a bag of Skittles. But George Zimmerman, what he saw was a suspicious figure in a hoodie with his hands in his pockets. What made him suspicious? This has to do with identity and black identity in this country. Um, and it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard constantly fighting against the constant, relentless, barrage of images that you see every day telling you who and what you're supposed to be you know fka twigs who's a, a singer that you know she's gaining a lot of popularity she's a british singer a european singer she recently came out and said um you know when i first came out before there weren't any images of me around people would leave comments on my videos and on my work saying this is outside of genre this is genre bending i've never heard anything like this she goes, you know, and then once my picture came out, now that they see that I'm a black girl from London, now I'm singing R&B music, you know. I see the same thing all the time with, with mainstream media outlets calling black male singers rappers, you know. The R&B singer August Alsina recently collapsed at a show. He, he suffered from a seizure, unfortunately. And I've seen tons of mainstream media outlets saying rapper August Alsina. August Alsina is not a rapper. He doesn't rap. He doesn't have not a single rap song. He's a singer. I've seen Chris Brown referred to as a rapper. I've seen Trey Songs referred to as a rapper. Rapper Neo. I've seen Neo referred to as a rapper. Just because they're black males, they're automatically seen as rappers because that stereotype and that caricature ties into the idea that the white gaze already has about black identity, right? And if we don't kind of play into those roles, a lot of times we're told that we're not authentic that we're not an authentic part of what they think blackness should be, that we're not black enough. Um, I read an article about a famous writer, a black female writer, also in London in the UK. Um, she's written a series of, you know, really great romance novels, and she puts black characters in all of her books, black women, I'll include a link. And she gave, said in an interview recently that she gave, she was describing how she's had white readers come to her readings and they kind of like laughingly, jokingly, haha, but they say, oh, you know, I didn't realize your characters were black until I was halfway through the book and then I had to go back and read it again. I feel like you tricked me, you know, you tricked me into thinking this was a regular person. What are they really saying, right? A regular person to them is a white person. A black person, a Hispanic person, a person of color is other, is an other person. And they feel like they've been tricked into reading about a black person without their, you know, their white gaze on, you know, like, oh, I thought I was reading about a regular person, but in actuality, I'm reading about a black person. Let me go back and see if I can catch the slang, you know? She said she she also said in the interview how she had a hard time getting published when she was first trying to get published because publishers would tell her her books were not authentic. Her books were not authentic enough. 
she was not giving enough of the authentic black experience in her books. And she goes, what are you talking about? I'm black. I'm writing women that are like me, upper middle class black women, you know, that are friends, that have book clubs, that go to the gym, that go to the store, you know, they're romance novels. Well, you know, whatever. And they're like, oh, but they're not authentic enough. They're not black enough. Can you black it up, you know? And, and these are, like I said, ideas about authenticity and ideas about identity that people already have in their mind. You know, I'm going to read you guys an excerpt from the New York Times article, uh, which I will link because it was wonderful. There it goes. Black bodies in America continue to be reduced to their surfaces and to stereotypes that are constricting and false, that often force those black bodies to move through social spaces in ways that put white people at ease. We fear that our black bodies incite an accusation, so we move in ways that help us survive the, the procrustean gazes of white people. We dread that those who see us feel the irrational fear to stand their ground rather than finding common ground. And basically, you know what this means, and he also goes on, That's that I should include, um, he was writing about Trayvon Martin. He says, Trayvon Martin is wearing the hoodie, a piece of racialized attire that signifies black criminality. Zimmerman said something's wrong with him. He's got something in his hands. I don't know what his deal is. And this kind of automatically made him, you know, a suspicious figure, a problem that needed to be handled, a drug addict, you know, what have you. And basically what these quotes are saying is that you know, black bodies in America kind of already have our narrative written for us. And this also goes back to my other video, which was talking about the legacy of slavery. Black bodies in America already have our narrative written. We already have these ideals that people are going to carry about us no matter what. Be it the angry black woman caricature, the drug dealing gang banger thug caricature, you know, be it the hypersexual, fast tailed little girl, be it the loud, obnoxious, talking back woman, young woman, teenager, you know, these are concepts of identity that we have no control over and we have no say in. It's kind of already expected from non-black people, you know, from white people, that we're going to act this way. And if we don't conform, they're either going to, one, twist the narrative to fit that, as we see in these multiple, you know, cases and shootings of murder where they say, well, this person was suspicious, even though that person wasn't doing anything, you know, the New York Times writer was walking down the street carrying a telescope. A cop saw him and immediately said, I almost blew you away because he already had twisted what his own eyes were seeing to fit the narrative of a, of a young black male with a weapon that's a threat. So we're already kind of battling against that. Like, we're trying to find our own identity, but we're all, we're already fighting against the identity that America wants to put on us as black Americans. And I hesitate to even call us Americans because we're clearly not equal citizens of this country. But we're trying to find our own identities, and we're already, you know, resisting an identity that black America is trying to force on us. You know, a narrative about authenticity, about black authenticity, about what it means to be black, about how authentic our experiences are. You know, when we try to find ourselves just like any other person, you know, when we try to take our hero's quest we're pushed to the side. We're told that we're not acting black enough. We're not being authentic enough. We're not fitting into the mold that they want to put on us. And again, this comes from both sides, not only white people, but black people as well, because the black community is also culpable in enforcing a lot of stereotypes and kind of singling out black youth that dare to, you know, not conform and make them kind of pariahs in the community. So it's just really difficult. Um, black identity and black authenticity are constructs that, you know, the majority of us struggle with every day. Where do we belong? You know, we don't really belong anywhere. If we try to conform to the black community, we may not necessarily be being true to ourselves. 
And then we, we're definitely not, you know, what the white community thinks of us. You know, we, we're not given the, the freedom and the liberty to explore the same way that white people are, to find ourselves, to find who we want to be, what we want to do, where we want to go, how we want to live our lives, how we're going to grow into mature, productive members of society. We're not given that chance, really. We're kind of just given these boxes and these, and these, these checks that we're supposed to, to follow and fit into, and it's... It's hard. It's difficult. You know, I'm young. I feel like I struggle every day with identity and with authenticity. Am I being authentic? Am I being real? Am I being true to myself? Am I selling out? Am I fitting in? Am I normal? Am I weird? Am I a freak? Am I strange? You know, and all that is compounded by the racial identity that white America and the white gaze tries to force on me every day. It's difficult. It's a difficult path that we walk in this country. Um, and I'll definitely make another video about this because it's something that I have a lot of deep feelings about. This is kind of just a, an introductory video, I guess. Um, it is Friday, so keep it, keep it simple. Keep it light for you. Um, and hopefully you guys enjoy this one. I'm so sorry that it's dark. It's raining and my light is trash. Uh, so hopefully you guys enjoy this one. And I'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. And see you guys next time. Food for thought as always. Peace.